When I accepted Jesus into my heart as Lord and Savior, and I'm kind of ashamed to admit this to you, but it was kind of a, um, a logical calculus. That, that's not probably the best way to do it, but I'm telling you this is just the truth, all right? What I, what I knew, what I had been told was this. I had been told that um, the God of the universe has uh, offered me the opportunity to live a victorious life if only I would accept his son Jesus into my heart as Lord and Savior. Now, saying it that way, again, I know it sounds kind of dispassionate, and I'm, um, but it, that probably best describes the reason why I did it at the time that I did it, that I accepted Christ. It wasn't until literally months later, perhaps even um, a year later, that um, that kind of dispassionate business relationship was transformed. And I can tell you almost exactly how and when it happened. I was about 17 years old. Uh, I, um, again, had been a Christian for several months. I was sitting at home. I was listening to some Christian music, and I was praying. And um, it was in the midst of all that that a thought occurred to me. And now today, I know that it was the Holy Spirit speaking into my life. Uh, and I'm going to just let you all know that there are times... You, people always say to me, well, how do you know? How, why does God talk to you and doesn't talk to me? There are times God's talking to you, and you're simply just not recognizing his voice. Because God speaks to us in different ways and through different people all the time. And simply because you didn't recognize it doesn't mean you, he's not doing it. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. So... At the time, I knew that the, I, I didn't know, but I, a thought occurred to me, and I know now that it was the Holy Spirit saying something to me, and this is what the Holy Spirit was saying. And it was a thought, it was, it was basically this. The God of the universe, the creator of the universe, loved me. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to be anything or act any certain way. He just loved me for who I am. Now, you're all sitting there, uh, well, duh, right? Is that what you're thinking? That you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound terribly profound. But to a teenager, a insecure teenager, who at times was self-loathing, because that's who I was at the time, I'm, and I'm telling you right now, it's been a long time since I've been a teenager, but I know this is the truth, that well, it's not just teenagers. There are times when we all kind of feel self-loathing. For someone who was insecure and self-loathing, coming to grips with the fact that the God of the universe loved me, it's just like, Pfft. it changed everything. Now, I tell you that story this morning because it defines in a very real way how I perceive God today. So when I think about God, you want to know what comes to mind? You know what thought comes to my mind first? Love. Because the God of the universe is head over heels in love with me. Not because I'm all that, but because he's all that. I'm sorry if I'm screaming back there, by the way. Apologize. It's worth it. The God of the universe loves me for some odd reason that I just know that he does. And, and that's the first thought that comes to my mind when I think about God. So I'm asking you today, what is the first thought that pops into your mind when you think about God? Now, that sounds like a very simple question, but it's probably the most important important and profound question that a human being could ever ask themselves. And today you're going to find out why that is. So let me ask again. When you think about God, what thought first pops into your mind? Because here, here's why it's so important. Because that first thought that pops into your mind when you think about God, that first thought in, in large part frames the kind of relationship you're going to have with God. Did you hear that? Now, that first thought, has, you're looking at it from a totally different perspective, right? Your first thought about God will frame the kind of relationship you have with God. In fact, your first third about, uh, thought about God will frame 
the perspective in which you engage the Bible, which is pretty important too. Which, by the way, if, uh, for those of you who may be guests or vis- visitors with us, we today we are starting here at Prairie Bible, we're starting um, an all-church study entitled Seamless, and the purpose of this study is to help give us a better perspective of God's Word, of, God, of the Bible. And today I'm going to tell you a story from God's Word, a story, I didn't, I've told you before many times I didn't grow up going to church, but even some non-churched kid like me had heard this story. This is how famous this story is that we're going to talk about today. But I want you to be careful not to presume you know the story, because you're going to hear the story today, I suspect, from a perspective that you've never experienced the story from before. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 3. And if you didn't bring your Bible, that's okay because we got Bibles everywhere. Grab one of those uh, ones we have in the chairs or bring your own. If you're using the one that we have, it's on page 3, right at the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of of, uh, context to the story before we get to the, the particular passage that we're going to look at. As you can probably tell already, the story that we are going to be uh, experiencing today together is the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, right? But it's not just the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. This is the story of when Adam and Eve were confronted by a serpent, who is the devil, in the garden. And this is where the perspective difference is going to come for you. So I want you to read this story. I'm not going to get into all the details of it today, but I want you to read this story for yourself today at some point. You can read it while I'm preaching too if you want to. But basically this is what's happening in this story. The story of Adam and Eve being confronted by the serpent in the garden. What is happening is that the serpent or the devil is planting a seed. And it's called a seed of doubt. Basically, what the the serpent or the devil is saying to uh, Eve in particular at this particular point, he is saying, um, he is saying, um, have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered why God said you could eat out of all the trees in the garden, the fruit off of any of the trees in the garden except for that particular one? Why do you suppose that is? Seems to me that it's possible anyway that maybe God's trying to hide something from you. It's possible that maybe the reason why God doesn't want you to eat from the tree of knowledge is because He's trying to keep you down. He doesn't want you to be as smart as He is. So that's why, you think that's why? He's telling you not to eat of the the fruit of the tree of knowledge? What do you think? Hmm. Well, Adam and Eve start to think. The seed's been planted. And the more they think about it, the more that they are convinced that they can't live without a bite of that fruit. What do you think that fruit was? What does the Bible say the fruit was? The Bible doesn't say what the fruit was. <laughs> it's setting you up. We always, we always hear these stories. It's the apple, right? And not, we don't know if it's an apple or not. It was a fruit from the tree of the knowledge. The tree of knowledge. Anyway, doesn't matter. They decided they couldn't live without a bite from that fruit. They didn't care what the consequences were. They just knew that they had to do it. So they did. And immediately... Upon taking a bite from that fruit, from the tree of knowledge, what happened? It says they suddenly realized they were naked. And they became ashamed. So, that brings us up to the passage in particular that I want you to focus on. Now, I don't know if that's the way you've remembered, or you were told the story or not, I don't know, but... So read the story yourself. Don't depend on me. But what I'm really asking you to do is read that story from that different perspective that I just described to you because this different perspective is is a big deal. 
So, it says in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says that um, one day when the wind was blowing, the man and the woman um, perceived that God was walking through the garden. Now, uh, the wind in the scriptures is often referred to as kind of an analogy of the Holy Spirit. So one of the, one of the reasons why they knew that God was walking through the garden was because that they heard the wind blowing through the trees of the garden. So you can imagine that, right? You're in a garden and you hear the wind blowing and they knew that, that the Lord was walking through the garden and when they knew that the Lord was walking through the garden, it says they hid in the trees. And when they hid in the trees, God says, God calls, cries out, Where are you? Now I'm going to stop right there for just a second. This is kind of a weird story anyway. I mean, a talking snake is weird anyway, right? That part of the story is weird. But the weirdest part of the story is that for whatever reason, they decided to play hide and seek with an omnipresent being. You know what I mean? You know what it means to be omnipresent? God is omnipresent. When you are omnipresent, that means you are everywhere all the time. Can you imagine playing hide and seek with someone who's already there all the time? You lose every time. Not a good idea. So, which, which raises another question is why would you even, why would God, who is omnipresent, who is everywhere all the time, who already knew where they were, why would God say, where are you? I'm trying to get you to look at this story from a different perspective. Why would God, who already knows where they are, ask the question, where are you? Remember before when I talked about the Holy Spirit being, or the wind being kind of like an analogy of the Holy Spirit? Well, in some respects, that's what's going on here. God, God knows, but he's, he's, he's trying to metaphorically almost like ask them to look at this whole thing from a different perspective. When he said, where are you? What he was really saying is, he was asking them to reflect. What, what's going on? What's changed? God knew what had changed. He was trying to get them to, to understand what has changed. What did change? It's very simple. The perspective from which they viewed God had changed. Prior to this whole event, you know how they, you know, when they thought of God, you know what the first thoughts came to their minds were? It's my daddy. He takes care of me. We go walking in the garden together. And I love him. And he loves me. Something changed, didn't it? The perspective in which they viewed their daddy, instead of this loving um, I know that he loves me because I know that he loves me, was now, well, does he really? Is, is dad really trying to keep something from me? Can I really trust him? You see how important the perspective from which you view God is? Let me ask you again. What's the first thought that comes to your mind when you think about God? It's a big deal. Now, some people, when they hear this story from this particular perspective, they think, well, everything changed when they eat that apple. If only they hadn't eaten that apple or that fruit or whatever it was. No, that's not when the perspective began to change. Their perspective began to change 
when the devil planted that seed. Now you're sitting back and you're going, well, see, it's the devil's fault. The devil made me do it. Stop that. Because the devil can't make you do anything. He didn't make Adam and Eve do anything, and he's not going to make you do anything. He can't. You get to choose. So the problem that they were facing wasn't that they doubted or that they had questions. Everybody doubts. Everybody has questions. The, when it became a problem was when they chose what they were going to do with their doubts and their questions. And what did they decide to do with their doubts and their questions? It says right there. They hid them from God. Do you understand? That's a big deal. You see, this is God gave you a brain. If you have, if you have questions, even if you have doubts, you need to know that, that questions and doubts do not offend God. God created you with a brain to think critically, to be a critical thinker. And you should use your brains. You should ask the questions and not be afraid of the doubts. You just need to bring them to God instead of hiding them. Or instead of thinking, well, I'm smarter than God anyway, so... If there's there's any doubt or or discrepancy here, it's probably God that's wrong and not me. Tell me that that isn't the way people think. The way you perceive God makes all the difference in the world. So when God says, when when God would love it if you came to Him today and you said, God, I've got some questions. God, I've even got a few doubts because of those questions. You know what God's going to do? God's going to say, let's talk. I love that you want to talk with me. And talk. The, and the, God will talk to you in all kinds of different ways. It'll be through a prayer maybe, like we talked about earlier when I was telling you when I had my moment. God may talk to you through reading your Bible. God may talk to you when you're having conversation with a, another brother or sister in the faith. Uh, God may talk to you in a, on a, a billboard. <laughs> God talks to us and answers our questions in all different ways. And then when we're, we're not afraid to go to God with our, with our questions and even with our doubts, and we come to Him from the right perspective as though He is a, a Papa that loves me and has my best interest no matter what, I can believe even when I've asked the questions and I still don't understand, I can believe that because He's my Papa, because He loves me, it's okay. Someday I'm going to get it. see the difference? Perspective makes all the difference. Now some people would sit back there, you're probably sitting out there in your chairs and you're probably going, how can he be so sure about all this? And I hope that I am conveying to you just how sure I am about every single word I just told you. But you might be asking, how can he be so sure about this? It's because I know that God is head over heels in love with me. Not because I'm all that, but because he is, right? And that is what God is asking you to believe about him today. Because if you... If you begin to, if, if, that's, if the way you think about God isn't that he's head over heels in love with you, he's in, it's not too late to change what you think about God. It's not. You get to choose. Adam and Eve got to choose. You get to choose too. What do I choose to be my first, my first thought about the nature of God? What do I choose to be the, the frame from which I view God? I choose to believe that he is head over heels in love with me because he is. And that's what he's asking you to believe too today. It's not too late to change. 
And when you choose that, not only will it change the perspective from which you read the Bible, which is what this whole new series is about, right? I'm going to tell you something. If you choose to believe that God is head over heels in love with you because he is, it will change everything that you perceive in life. Everything. It'll change um, the frustration that you feel when you're standing in the grocery line and they're way, going way too slow up there. Because instead of thinking, why does this, I'm such a hurry, why does this stuff always happen to me? You'll think, I wonder what purpose God has in this. In those moments when it feels like things are happening to you that don't seem to happen to anybody else, which is a lie, by the way. It's another one of those little whispers from the devil that says, "Why have you ever wondered why you're the only one that has bad luck? Okay, how many of you thought that today when you came to church? Why, is it, why am I the only one that has bad luck? When you change your perspective, you'll begin to understand that all things, all things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so and because my God is head over heels in love with me and you. <laughs> that, you know, we don't say amen enough here. Somebody say amen. amen. There you go. When you come forward this morning to receive communion, that's what God, that's the question God is posing to you. Will you choose to believe today that he is head over heels in love with you? Because he is.